morning, church. Welcome to Central. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. You made it. And so we're going to get into a time of worship. So I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing about Christ, our firm foundation. Amen. Hey. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad than I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So this morning. Do you believe that? He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be
So we lift up
nothing else fit for me except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bring the chasm that lay between So 
Church, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks this morning that your Son is our living hope. He is our testimony. Lord, he goes before us and has paved the way. So God, I thank you so much for all that you have done for us. And we recognize that this morning that there are so many prayers that are being offered up, whether it was today or throughout this week. God, we recognize that this is a space that we come to you with prayers of thanksgiving and joy and moments of happiness and gratitude. And yet we also have prayers that are being offered up that express the pain and difficult times and trials that we might be going through. And it's in this meeting space that all of these, the melting pot of these prayers, Lord, that we need to know one thing, that you are a God who is near, a God who is close to us. Lord, I pray that in all of these things that no matter whether we feel that you are near or not, God, that we would learn to know that you are near regardless. So God, I, I pray specifically over those in this congregation today who are going through hardships. And God, I just pray that you would be with them and surround them with a comfort and a peace that only you can provide. And Lord, for those who are here today that might be going through their minds, I don't know if I need to be here, but I'm looking for an answer. God, thank you that they're here. Thank you that they're here. And God, thank you for this congregation and the worship this morning. I pray that you would receive our words of praise and speak to us through Craig's message. And all God's people said, amen. All right, you may be seated. I get to do something a little bit fun this morning. I'm going to invite forward any of our graduating seniors, any of our graduating seniors I see a lot in the back. If you are a graduating senior right now, I'm gonna have you join me up on stage. Join me up on stage, graduates, as much as you don't want this. We're gonna honor you. Come on up here to the stage and we're gonna make a line right here. Come on up, graduates. Way to be seniors. Oh, y'all look so good today. Y'all look great. Well, this morning, I got, look at this. Uh, congratulations, seniors, congratulations. Well, church, oh, we, 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 oh, wait, I was gonna say, welcome, come on up. But this morning, I wanna do this. Graduates, you have done it. Can we just do this? Can we congratulate the class of 2023? I often say this, that I'm, I'm, I'm proud that you are here, but not only am I proud, but I know that there are some parents here who are also proud. And some parents this morning right now believe in miracles because you actually did it. You made it. You did it. So I'm going to do this. I just want to give you two pieces of advice this morning because a lot of times you're going to hear a lot of people probably ask you the same thing over and over. What are you doing? What are your plans? And you, you're providing those answers and we're there to eat food at your open houses. But I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. Number one, recognize that where you are is because you're standing on the shoulders of those who have poured into you. I often think of the game chicken. I love the summertime. I love being in the pool. Like, you know, in the game of chicken, how like, if you always, like, you always try to strategically pick your partner because you got to know, like, and trust them. Because when they're on top, like, when they're on top, like, if you don't have a good partner and they have no balance, it's more of like a game of survival. Because you're on bottom and you're just trying to just survive. And you're always like trying to do the best. Like, hey, like, and you're moving your body in a way to help give them a little bit more leverage and, and advantage. I want you to know this that your parents, that your loved ones in your life have been the base and the bottom for you in that game, where there have been times that you haven't even known, that they've been kind of holding you up and they've been having to adjust and pivot. And sometimes it's a little aggressive because if you feel like they're going down, they're going to pull a little bit harder and you're like, what's going on down there? Why are you doing this? Because they're trying to love you and to support you and to keep you to where you're at and to, to make sure that you grow. So I want to say this, there have been more tears and more prayers and more people that have helped you get to this spot in your life than you realize. And so parents and loved ones, thank you. I know this has not been easy and you get to celebrate this moment, but there are moments that maybe you wish you could have done over differently or maybe you realize, like, will they ever know what I did to get them here? They do. So graduates, Go forward in your life with a spirit of gratitude. That's my encouragement to you. And number two, number two is this. Remember that when you slip up, when you fall, when it feels like you backslide or you're just in a really bad spot as you move forward, none of us are expecting perfection from you. None of us. 
And so in the midst of that, please remember that when you do make mistakes, when you do trip up, because it's going to happen, that you have a church community body, you have family and loved ones that would rather you call, reach out, text, and communicate and process through with them than to try to handle those mistakes on your own. I know that for every adult in here, they wish that they would have had people that they, would have, that they could trust and love that would have been able to process through and help them through some of their problems rather than struggle through it alone. We're a congregation that doesn't just worship God looking forward, but in our worship of God, we get to oftentimes worship with those around us. And so I pray and I hope that as you move forward in life, whether that's a gap year or college or at school or work, or maybe it's just figuring yourself out, whatever you find yourself in, know this, lean into those people around you. You're not doing this alone. And so as we do this, I wanna do close in this final moment where I'm gonna have you just come forward and go up to an altar, find one of these moments and kneel down and we're gonna have invite forward your family. So if you wanna go ahead and make your way to an altar moment. And if you know one of these students or if your family or friends or you know them, I'm gonna invite you to come forward and we're gonna pray over them collectively. So families and loved ones, I'm gonna encourage you to come forward so we can pray over your students together. And as we did this in first service, it was kind of a cool moment where, you know, you see these students, but then you see the army of people who have helped them get to where they're at in their lives. And here's my word for you as we go into prayer. In scripture, there's these mentionings of moments called moments of consecration. And what that meant was oftentimes that God would have, uh, would t say, we're gonna consecrate either a moment or a place or a people in order to recognize the significance of this moment. And the consecration is saying, we are going to spiritually prepare you for the future that God has for you. And so in this very moment, we're gonna pray for you. And congregation, whether you're sitting or watching online, I, I just pray that you would maybe, if you're here, extend your hand forward as a sign of joining us in prayer over these young people as we just ask for God's best in their life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for these young people. Lord, the fact that I know that there are parents that are trying to think in their minds, I can't believe they're already here. I feel like it was just yesterday that I was holding them in my arms and here they are now. God, I just thank you for these parents. I thank you for the loved ones near them that have poured into them, all the, the coaches and mentors and teachers and, and friends that have helped develop them into the people that they are. God, thank you. I pray a special just outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon them just in order to prepare them for their lives and the journey ahead. God, I pray against the enemy that might try to whisper in their ears that when they make mistakes that they don't have a home to come back to or a people to talk to because of fear of condemnation. God, I pray against that. Jesus, would you allow them to know in this very moment that when the mistakes happen, that's when we want to be with them even more so that we can know that we can encourage them, we can love them, and we can support them into the journey that you have placed in front of them. God, I pray over these young people. We consecrate this moment. We give it to you, and we set them aside for your will and for your purpose. God, we recognize it. We, re we know the words of Constantine in his work, City of God, said that our human happiness has reached its fullest potential when God's will becomes our will. So, Lord, would your will become ours in this moment? We pray over these young people, and all God's people said, amen. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. Man, oh man. Well, as we, as we exit that moment, I just want to say this. Welcome to Central. If you're new here, we're so excited that you chose to worship with us this morning. My name is Spencer, like I said, and I'm a high school pastor here. And if you are a guest or you're new here, whether you're watching online or in person, um, I would like you to do this. Pull out your phone, and uh, if you want to know what's going on, you can pull out your phone, and you can scan the QR code in front of you, or you can scan the QR code up on the screen behind me. And that is a miracle in and of itself. Growing up as a pastor's kid, there used to be these things called bulletins. I don't know if you know what this is. It's a paper bulletin. And when you grow up in a small church, uh, basically be I became child labor, uh, and I remember folding hundreds of bulletins in a three tri fold every single week. But now we have this beautiful gift of being able to say, if you want to know what's going on here at Central, just look at the bullets, the QR code and the bulletin, pull out your camera and the link will come up. Click on that. 
But also, if you're new, I want you to pull out your phone and text us. Text Central Holland, one word, to 94000. And that is our way. You'll do that, and we'll send you a text back. And that'll allow us to connect with you about what's happening here at Central or another ways to get plugged in. Whether you're saying, hey, I, I want to know about baptism. I want to know more about my faith. I want to join a discipleship, uh, discipleship group, men's group, women's group, whatever it may be. We want to connect with you. We want to connect with you. And here uh, also as we move into some of those things, uh, here at Central, we will put a challenge out regarding our giving lately. And I just want to say thank you. We have, we, we recognize that in the last couple of weeks, you've heard us talk about that we have been in a deficit and we put the challenge out to those to say, man, if, if, if you're able, if God would, would place that on your heart to be able to give a little more in this season because we're getting ready to wrap up our fiscal year on June 1, maybe that's just put that in your prayer life. And we put that challenge out and we haven't fully caught up, but we, we definitely made some ground. So I just want to say thank you for your already faithfulness in your giving. But just a reminder as well that we are still in a deficit. And so for those who are able, we would so appreciate your faithfulness in giving in that way. There are three ways that you can give. Number one, you can give online. Your tithes can be a one-time tithe or it can be a reoccurring tithe as well that you can set up through uh, your online giving. You can give at one of the kiosks, which are in the balcony and also in the lobby. And of course, you can always mail in your offering. And I will say this, as a student pastor, I wanna just say one of the things that, that we are able to use in the faithfulness of this giving, I just wanna say thank you. There are so many opportunities and things that I'm able to do as a student pastor because of your faithfulness and to pour into these young people in ways you'll never see, But and I don't even know who you are that's giving, but I just have to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and for what we're able to do with your generosity. And with that, uh, we're gonna be moving into a new series this morning called Homecoming that Pastor Craig will be kicking off. Spencer, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a series called Homecoming. Glad that you are joining us for it. Now, Homecoming uh, was introduced into America in the early 20th century. The first Homecoming was organized by the uh, University of Missouri, and it happened in 1910. Alumni were invited to the home game against their arch rivals. Anybody know who the arch rival of Missouri is? Kansas, well, it was back then. Don't know what it is now. Yeah. But that's part of the problem for me, you see, because what became a part of American culture here, homecoming, expanding to universities, colleges, uh, high schools, even some businesses, actually is completely alien to me. Never even heard of it. In fact, if you'd have asked me to describe homecoming when we moved to the States in 2008, I would have described the ascension of Jesus. That was this Thursday, May 18, remember the ascension? And uh, I would have described that because to me that's the best homecoming that there is. I mean, the, the idea of homecoming, the word homecoming isn't in the New Testament, so it isn't in the Bible. So if you ask me to describe homecoming, I'm thinking, okay, there's nothing like uh, the homecoming of Jesus. Can you imagine that as a homecoming? I mean, Jesus returning to the Father we're told in the Scriptures there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over all of the righteous. Can you imagine with me the rejoicing in heaven when Jesus would have returned? What a homecoming that would be. And that homecoming gives hope and inspiration to everyone who's ever laid a loved one into the belly of the earth. There is hope because this world is not our home. There is a home that awaits us. Homecoming. Now, of course, when you start to think about the ascension of Jesus and, and that homecoming, another idea starts to uh, kind of trickle through with homecoming. It's the idea of family reunions. Now, if we take that approach to homecoming, there are lots of scriptural examples for this, right? Uh, take Luke 15 as an example. That's the lost chapter in the Bible. You have the lost coin. You have the lost sheep, right? And then you have the lost son, the only one who doesn't like homecomings are grumpy older brothers. That's basically the way that that works. But then we can go back to the very beginning, Genesis. We can think about Joseph, Egypt, reunified with his brothers and then with his 
and with his father, what a reunion that is. We can fast forward then to the, towards the, the kind of middle to the end of the Old Testament to the return of the Jews from exile in Babylon uh, to Jerusalem. What a homecoming that is. And so when we view homecoming from that perspective, uh, we get the idea of homecoming being something that individuals can use to connect with their past, to celebrate in the present, and to prepare for the future. That's what homecoming is. It gives us an opportunity to connect with our past, celebrate in the present, and to prepare for the future. Now, I'm going to lay the foundation for what we're going to do over the next few weeks. Next week, Corey is up. Uh, he'll be up for the next two weeks, and I'm back up on uh, June the 11th. And to set that foundation, I'd love if you could turn to Ezra chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, go to Ezra chapter 3. Um, in this passage, God's people have returned to Jerusalem after seven decades of exile in Babylon. And in this story, they're going to reconnect with their past through restoring the altars. They're going to celebrate in the present by offering sacrifices and showing that commitment to worship. And they are going to prepare for their future by renewing their commitment to God. And this is what homecoming is about. It's about a connection with the past. It's about a celebration in the present. And invariably, there's some kind of preparation going on for the future. Homecoming. So let's jump into this. Homecoming connects us with the past. Have a look at verse 3. Ezra 3, verse 3. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. Despite the opposition, they were committed to reconnecting with their past, and they demonstrated that through rebuilding the altar. And of course, they could not rebuild it to its former glory, but they wanted to rebuild it not because they needed a physical structure, but because they wanted to spiritually consecrate themselves and connect themselves with the faith of their forefathers. So this altar is a symbol of the covenant relationship that existed between God and His people. This altar symbolized that place where they covenanted to God in love. And so, with every homecoming, there's a powerful connection with the past. That idea shouldn't be lost on us as Hollanders. Every year, we celebrate a tulip time where our children will dress up in their old Dutch costumes that when I first moved here and Jordan came home and said, we've got this parade, and Vipka said, we need to get in Dutch clothes. I'm like, for what? I mean, she's German. The Germans and the Dutch don't get on, if you didn't know. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? And so I go downtown to this parade. I lived in Tampa. Parades in Tampa were about pirate ships. Pirates? Okay, at least there's a little bit more history to this one, right? And I'm watching this happening. I'm like, what's going on here? It's actually a connection to the past. And it's an important connection to the past, and especially if you're a Christian, because you realize that Van Ralty founded Holland, and there was a number of reasons for that, one of which was it offered Christians a safe place to worship, escaping the persecution and the opposition to worship that there was in Europe. And so when you have this, this kind of festival that, that takes you back, the idea is it is really important to connect with your past. It's not a physical thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's important to connect with our past because what you take with you stays with you. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a homecoming of sorts. We do this Every year, we've started over the last couple of years where we invite in our pastors from our family of churches, and, and this year, we're going to invite in the pastors and the worship leaders from our family of churches around the world. We do that because we think it's really important for them to connect with their past. Our family of churches has grown to 19 locations, nine in the U.S., 10 around the world, and we would never have thought that that was possible when we started this in 2015. 
But we started this not to make a name for ourselves, but through the realization that what Jesus' mission is in this world is to build His church. And we wanted to partner with Jesus as He builds His church. For us, building churches takes more work and more effort than planting churches. And so we started this, and we started this with this commitment to generously invest in the things that are important to Jesus. And this is what's grown as a result of it. And we invite these pastors back. And we do that because we want to remind them of where this all began and why this all began. Now, some of the people coming in have been here before. Some of them coming in have never been here before. And what I love about that is the fact that when they come in here, I know that they will be welcomed by you as if they are returning home. Now, I'm excited for everybody to come, but I'm really excited for one person to come. That's Corey. No, not our Corey, but my Corey. Our Corey is K-O-R-E-Y, uh, K-O-R-Y, my Corey is C-O-R-E-Y. Corey is my cousin. Corey, I remember Corey uh, many years ago when my uncle used to visit my mom and her brother, okay, Stuart, her son was Corey. When they used to visit, Stuart was the, uh, Corey was the awkward teenager who would never come in. He would always stay out in the car. You can ask him that one. Hey, Corey, why did you always stay out in the car? Why didn't you come back in? He's like, what is Corey saying, right? But didn't know Christ. Later on, my mom led my uncle to Christ, and then as an adult, Corey came to faith in Christ. He sensed God calling him into ministry, paid himself to go through seminary, uh, to get a bachelor's in theology and then a master's in theology. And this is Corey now standing in the pulpit of his little small uh, church in Wales where I grew up. Now, when you meet Corey, because Corey is being invited back here, when you meet Corey, you will realize that I am not Welsh and I do not have an accent. <laughs> this is what I should sound like, and you will thank God every time that you hear this guy speak, if you get to it, that I sound nothing like that. You think I take something to get used to? This guy leaves me for dead. But he, here's the significance of this. I'm looking at Dean there. I was looking at Sue earlier on. Dean was one of the elders when I came here, and I would often share with the elders that I had this, this sense, this passion for home. See, Wales had a strong history. 1904, Welsh Revival. The church that I was saved in was built by my grandfather. But ministry is tough. And I remember saying to Dean, I just have this sense for home but I don't know what to do. I need, we need God to raise up people for the place where I was born to, to do a work there. Little did I expect that God would answer that prayer by saving a member of my own family. God works in strange ways. Home. A number of you will reconnect with family members here who come home, and they come home because it's really important to connect. And when you connect at home, what you are doing is you are building strong relationships. You are fostering that sense of belonging, but you also, if you're doing this properly, take the moment to reinforce and to champion those traditions and those values that actually made you who you were. That's why we do this thing every year where we invite these people back. We want to say, listen, we want to bring you home to remind you of what you were called and commissioned to do, to remind you of why we have invested so much in all of you. It's because the work of Jesus knows no end. But the good news is you don't do this on your own. You do this with family, and we are family. 
And so in the first part of, of this verse, what we see in verse 3 is that they're, they're coming home and they're connecting with their past. They're restoring their relationships with one another. They're deepening those relationships. They're fostering their sense of belonging to that place. But they're also being reminded to champion those traditions and those values that made them who they were. Let me ask you this. Do you take time to remember those traditions and those values? values that made you who you were. Some of us may find that difficult because maybe our past is littered with brokenness and hardship. But I encourage you, revisit your past. Don't ignore your past because when you revisit it, even if it's difficult, you will experience the healing power of God freeing you from the pain of the past and actually setting you up for a future that requires you to engage with your past. Just this week, think about those traditions and values that made you who you were and forge a sense of connection to them because good homecomings always do that. Uh, secondly, here we see in verses 4 through 6 that homecoming serves to celebrate the present. Celebrate the present. Have a look at verses 4 through 6. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and sacrifices for all of the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Do you notice there how verse 6 says, on the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings, when the preceding two verses seem to describe them already having done it. And so this leads commentators to ask that question, wait a minute, when did they actually start to do these burnt offerings? This seems confusing. And so you get all of this kind of theological conversation and debate about when did it start? Did it start with tabernacles? Did it start later than that? What is it? I think the point of verse 6 is to emphasize the priority of worship because if you have a look at it, it says, they began to offer burnt offerings even though the foundation had not yet been laid. In other words... What you have here is a commitment to celebrate and to worship even though things aren't perfect. You have a statement to the priority of worship even though it's very hard to do it because what you're looking at, what you're experiencing is nothing like what it should be. How many of us wrestle like that? How many of us come in here week after week recognizing the priority of worship but struggling to do it because something in our life is not yet perfect? Something in our life hasn't been worked out yet. This is the point of verse 6. There they are, committed to worship, and because they are committed to worship, they're able to work through the imperfections of worship and still praise God. Can you do that? How many of you struggled with that second song, I throw up my hands, you struggled to do it because you argued on the way into church? How many of you struggle to do that because there's something that you're working through that God isn't working in your life in the way that you'd like Him to, or because there's something going on that it emotionally is weighing you down to such a degree that it's very difficult for you to do that because that is a symbol of consecration and openness, and you just aren't there. The priority of verse 6 and the point of verse 6 is to show the priority of worship even when the environments for it are not perfect. In other words, they were committed to celebrating and being grateful even though there was a lot that was wrong. 
tabernacles, this harvest, this was the feast of great celebration, great joy. It was in the seventh month, and on the first day, right at the beginning, they do it even though things weren't perfect. How many of you struggle to do that? More to the point, let's go a little deeper with this. How many of us struggle to celebrate anyway, especially spiritual things? Uh, it's really interesting to me that the number of people who come up to me and say things like, Craig, you know what, I, I'm re- I, I really like the old hymns and this kind of stuff, or, or I really like the, the, the kind of slower songs where I can just stand there and I can just worship God so freely, but when you do those boppy things, I don't like it. What am I supposed to do with that? brings me back to one of my great tulip time memories, 2018. In 2018, the Beach Boys were on this stage. And one of the perks of being the pastor here is when there is no ticket, I can stand in the sound booth. (laughs) No need to flash my badge, right? It's just like, oh, it's Craig. We can let him go in. So the Beach Boys were on the stage. So I kind of Grew up listening to the Beach Boys, surfed in Wales and this kind of stuff. So I came through the doors, went up there, right where Kim is right now. And, and I was there looking and horror of horrors. I saw people who don't know what to do with these fast songs doing everything to the Beach Boys. And they were doing it in their very seat that they sit in on a Sunday like this. And I'm like, oh, I really want to take my phone out right now. I really wanted to record this thing because clearly these limbs do move, (laughs) but just not for Jesus. No, I shouldn't have said that, right? (laughs) What's my point with this? Listen, some of us, some of us struggle to be expressive. I said before, I, I put me next to my wife. I'm like a statue, okay? I'm just not very expressive. That's why I've never gone to many concerts, Christian concerts or otherwise. In fact, I don't think I've ever been to a secular concert. Don't get me the tickets. I'm fine. I don't know what to do with the fast songs, okay? <laughs> but put me next to my wife, expressive. And I'm, a couple of months ago, Vipka said, Craig, I'd really like to go see Maverick City. I'm like, oh, no, they like the fast stuff. <laughs> so there we are in the Van Handel Arena, right? And you got these songs on, and of course, I have to go with it. And I am the most uncomfortable person going with that kind of thing in my life. In fact, we were doing a wedding one time in London, and uh, I had to go and do the first dance with a couple, and my boss came up to me and said, Craig, it's really good to see somebody who's as uncomfortable on the dance floor as I am. (laughs) So look, I I get the fact, I really do get the fact that for some of us to be expressive is really difficult, difficult. But I'll tell you what, if you can express for the Beach Boys, why can't you express for Jesus? Be who you are, but whoever you are, celebrate. There will always be reasons for you not to. For them, all they had to do is look and realize this is not perfect, but they knew one thing. God was always worthy of praise. God was always worthy of praise. So one of the ideas here in homecomings is that it enables us to connect with the past, but also that it it challenges us to celebrate in the present. And so, when we invite some of these pastors and worship leaders back, we're going to be celebrating. We're not going to be celebrating because look at what we've done. We're going to be celebrating because, wow, look at what God has done. And so next week, Corey's going to share. He's going to be Corey, but he's also going to be sharing stories about what God has done. Why? Because what God has done should never be forgotten. Because what God has done provides us with the inspiration to believe that God's not done yet. What God has done, God can still do. So we're going to celebrate because celebration, as difficult as it is for some of us, has a part to play in the church of Jesus. So it connects us with the past, 
helps us celebrate the present, and thirdly, it offers us a chance to prepare for the future. This is where we get to Ezra 7, uh, 3, 7 through 13. And in that, we learn a number of things about preparing for the future. Now, one of the things my research into homecomings uh, kind of reminded me was that when alumni would go, especially in universities and colleges, they'd go back to a homecoming thing, invariably some kind of plan for the future would be unveiled. And this plan usually involves a couple of things. Hey, this place is a really good place for you to send your kids. Before we even moved to the States, I was getting all of these with paraphernalia from all of these colleges that I'd never heard of. Somebody was trying to recruit me from the church to make sure I was a gator, a knoll, or whatever else it is, a hurricane, and it was even went as far as Alabama and Auburn. Can't do that. Right? This recruitment drives, they're trying to get you to, to kind of realize how important this is, send your kids there. There's some kind of plan for the future, or it could be some kind of initiative, capital initiative that is worthy of your investment. And, and whenever you go to these kind of things, it's like a gala dinner. Don't we just love it, get to the end of the year and you get these gala dinner invites? And it's like, oh Lord, I know what's coming. And then the speaker gets up and they make you laugh and then they tell a story that makes you cry and you're like, oh, they've done it again. Right? Now get out your checkbook. And whenever that happens, it kind of, there's that mixed emotion to it, right? So oh, I, I don't know. What's fascinating here, as they start to consecrate themselves spiritually for the future, what we see is this mixed emotion starting to come up. And, and I want us to spend a little bit of time on that. Because whenever there is a plan for the future being unveiled, mixed emotions are going to be a part of this. As couples, when you start to talk about the, the future, two of you have different ideas maybe on something, and, and then all of a sudden you've got this reality of mixed emotion. What Ezra teaches us is that mixed emotion that isn't dealt with leads to compromised behavior. We're going to read verses 12 and 13 where we'll see mixed emotion, but what I want you to remember at this stage is that that mixed emotion isn't processed through by a number of people, and by the time we get to chapter 10, we get compromised behavior because they haven't worked through their stuff. And Ezra finds himself in chapter 10 having to confront people because instead of standing firm in their commitment for God, there were mixed experiences with regard to what was going on, what should happen, and as a result of that, a number of people just started to back away from their commitment to God, and it led a number into not mixed race marriages, but mixed faith marriages, and the ministry was compromised. So here's the point. Whenever you deal with an aspect of the future, whether it be as a family, as a couple, in work, even in church, it's invariable that mixed emotions come up. But if we don't acknowledge mixed emotions, we get to the point of compromised behavior. And rather than having a meeting that deepens relationships, that fosters the sense of belonging, that ultimately champions those traditions and values that make us who we are. We start to compromise on those traditions and values. We start to back away. Our relationships start to fracture. And then all of a sudden, the unity that was there in the beginning isn't there. That's the way this story goes because they don't deal with mixed emotions. If we don't deal with mixed emotions relationally, our behavior is compromised. Our unity is destroyed and our relationships suffer. So have a look at this with me. This is why these verses are important. Verses 12 through 13 say this. But many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise. And the sound was heard far away. You know, whenever I read that, I think of Paul. Everything in church should be done decent and in order. Can you imagine what Paul would have thought of this? This was a mess. The older people are crying. The younger people are celebrating. And the people who are opposed to all of this think these people are nuts. 
They couldn't make out what was going on. There was no order. There is so much mixed emotion as a part of this. So what does this tell us? Firstly, it tells us when we're planning for the future in any kind of context, emotions are important, but they're also complex. The emotions that are triggered when we're planning for the future are complex. Some wept, some rejoiced. So whenever you plan for the future, just recognize, okay, I need to be really careful here because the emotions involved in planning for the future are really complex and there are so many different things that actually lead a person to think what they think, to feel what they feel, to do what they do. Emotions are important, but they're complex. Secondly, what it tells us is this. When we bring hope and joy to a planning process, for a number of people, what they experience is the complete opposite. So that tells us the planning for the future is nearly always a mixed experience. It can have positive, it can have negative reactions. And I've experienced that in leadership, I experienced that here at Central. It's interesting seeing the students on the stage here. In 2015, we unveiled that our plan for the future. We called it Stronger. We wanted to be stronger home and away. And uh, when I came in here, one of the key things we noticed was that there were a number of projects that we needed to get done that had been postponed for over a decade. And it kind of said, okay, Craig, it, it kind of falls to you to lead us through this thing. And so we unveiled this $9.2 million project. And uh, we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We have a vision for our student ministry that our high schoolers don't have to go to cell block H every Sunday. Cell block H. Some of you may remember that. It was just out there. If you go online, I think Google still has cell block H. If you go and do a Google view on down here, it hasn't got the new building that we put in 2015, it's still got cell block H. We used to send our high school kids, okay, and our middle school kids into cell block H, out into the cold, minus whatever it was. Remember 14 and 15, the winters those years? They were winters. Uh, the snow was so high, we felt like we were going through tunnels. We would send them there all the time. And then there was another problem, was with the older folks, their Sunday school classes were too far away from the auditorium here. And so we talked to Evergreen Commons and a number of other people, and we came up with this 100 feet guarantee that we wanted a, an older person whose mobility challenge not to have to walk more than 100 feet from their like, Sunday school classroom into the auditorium. So we did the, the legacy room. We did all of this, $9.2 million challenge. And uh, you may remember that uh, we had Torrin here from TLC and a number of other people, and we had these green stress balls. Remember those green stress balls? Whenever you talk about the future, there's the stress. I've still got this green stress ball on my desk. And whenever I'm thinking through things, I'm either bouncing this ball as I'm walking around or I'm just de-stressing with it. But anyway, after a presentation like that, I thought Playland was in there too. I thought, okay, this, this went good, but just waiting for the, uh, the appointments to come. And in true fashion, they did. One after the other, people were wanting to have a conversation with me about it. And uh, I expected that. But what I didn't expect was the number one issue that people had. The number one issue that people had when they came to me was, have a look at your pews. Have a look down at your pews. The coffee cup holder. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. <laughs> coffee cup holder? I wasn't even the one responsible for putting the coffee cup holders in. They were put in the year before I came. But person after person came to me and talked about the coffee cup holder. <laughs> I'm like, God, what, what, what is this about? But I'm smart enough to realize that this wasn't about a coffee cup holder. The coffee cup holder was a symbol of something else. It was a symbol of them thinking that the glory that had been on this church in the past would be lost if we ever tried to go too commercial and too modern. That's what they were saying. And you know what? For every generation that sits in the seat right now, that is a valid concern. That's what's happening in Ezra 3. We're told that the older priests, those people that remembered what it was like before, 
looked at what was and wept. You know why they wept? They wept because what was was the place where they experienced the glory of God. The old temple had the Shekinah glory of God fall on it in a way that these stories became just folklore that basically reverberated around their community. And when they went back and they saw what was, they wept because they remembered how God had moved in the past and they were fearful that they would never ever see God move like that again. And you know what? Part of that was right. The Shekinah glory of God never fell on the new temple in the way it did on the old. It took Jesus coming for the glory of God to tabernacle amongst his people. But the younger people rejoiced because they saw this as an incredible opportunity to put themselves to work and to build a future where their kids and their grandkids could ultimately be reached. See, whenever we deal with a plan for the future, the emotions are complex. And we are wise when we recognize that planning for the future is always a mixed experience. But recognizing that, the wise amongst us are the ones who deal with their mixed emotions, especially those decisions that don't go our way and commit to unity nonetheless. Central's history tells us that. This history of this church is built on people who successfully overcame their mixed emotions when things did not go their way. One of those, Dick Darby. Now, Dick passed away a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he is a hero and a friend of this church. But there's a story where Dick had to work through his mixed emotions. Back then, the church was growing, and there was concern that the land that we had, I think it's around the time of the multi-purpose room, which was downstairs, that was the, the main auditorium, then the chapel. There was concern that we did not have enough space to meet the growth of the church. And so a conversation arose. And the conversation focused around the idea, do we stay on this site or do we look for somewhere else? It was 16th Street, kind of towards Zealand. Okay, do we look for somewhere else to ultimately invest in to allow this church to grow to the point that it eventually would? And Dick was a proponent of the move. He stood up and he, in the membership meeting, he passionately spoke out for and worked for, campaigned for, a vote that basically would see us leave this site. Remember, we were originally on 17th and Pine and we came up here. So we weren't, we weren't opposed to moving. He, he was passionate in believing that the best thing for this church was to move from this site and ultimately go uh, further east along 16th Street. The vote came and the church decided it was not going to move. It was going to stay. Let me ask you this. If you were involved in a church and you passionately spoke up for something that you believe was the right thing to do, dare I even say the God thing to do, and the church decided something different, would you stay or would you go? Most people go. Dick didn't go. He stayed. More than that, it was Dick who forged the key relationships with Ed Prince with Providence Church that ultimately enabled us to get the property we needed to actually be a part of what we are a part of right now. Dick worked through his negative emotions and ultimately we were blessed because we did. Let me ask you this. When decisions don't go your way, how do you respond? Successful homes are based on the ability to work through mixed emotions. Successful churches are too. Secondly, Grandma Kreithoff. This story again goes down in folklore. It's funny, with these stories, there, there are so many I have from this church that I, I can picture them. I've heard them so many times with so many different people. I, I can picture being there, and, and I can actually see it in my head. I don't know what any of these people, apart from Dick, but I don't know what the Grandma Kreithoff looked like. But it's like I was there. Now the conversation, church is growing, different time scale, time period, church is growing. 
What are we going to do? We've got this commitment to missions, Holland and beyond. We want to make sure that we're not just investing in ourselves, we're investing in the world. But we need this facility being built. What do we do? How do we do this? Grandma Krydov stood up and made a passionate petition for us not to invest in buildings, but to invest in people. And she was passionate about this. The vote came, the vote went the other way. Again, let me ask you this question. What do you do when you're in a church where you think the more money needs to be invested in people and they make a decision to invest in buildings? What do you do? Many people leave. After the vote was announced, I would love to have been there for this. Grandma Krydov stood up. I would not have wanted to be the MC at that moment. <laughs> you look at that and it's like, uh-oh. She shuffled away towards the front. Uh-oh. As an MC, you're like, do I give her the microphone? No. What's she going to do? What's she going to say? She comes to the front, and this story goes, she had this black purse that was just kind of worn and, you know, kind of rough. And she fusses around in the front. And of course, today, if anybody comes to the front and they fuss around in the back, security are on them in an instant, right? <laughs> and she pulls out a dollar bill. And she goes to the microphone and she said, well, if this is what we're going to do, let me be the person to invest the first dollar. And since that time, and far longer than this, we've been recording this since 2001, since we built this auditorium, 25 cents on every dollar, about $35 million has been invested in outreach, even though this, all of this has been built. The commitment that has been made to in that particular meeting, has followed all the way through. But again, mixed emotions. When something matters a great deal to you and it does not go your way, what do you do? Again, not working through mixed emotions leads to compromised behavior where your relationship is broken, the sense of belonging is destroyed, and the values and the traditions that took you where you were, that made you who you are, are no longer true of you. And it's not long before your behavior is compromised and everything is lost. This applies for us personally. And it also applies for the church communally. Now, when it comes to our future, there, there, is, there are plans that, that we need to make. And whenever we present a plan that needs to be made, right, there are these mixed emotions, and that's understandable. But you know, God has a vision on this church, not simply for our work around the world, but also for our work right here in Holland. And my hope and prayer is that all of you feel connected to that. But there's always mixed emotions. So I'm going to share a little bit right now for a couple of minutes about 30,000 feet, okay, some of the things that we feel God calling us to work on, and I just encourage you, work through those mixed emotions. I want our team to end this service by singing a song that they wrote that really talks about mixed emotions. It's called God of Delivering, and the whole idea is sometimes we walk, th walk through things that we walk through not because we've done anything, but because this is the way that God has seemingly orchestrated things. At other points in time, though, we walk through things because of the choices that we have made. But what is true in both instances, as mixed as those experiences are, is that God is faithful. God is always faithful. But as I share this, I'm sure that there will be some mixed emotions. You see here that our goal from June 1 through the end of May is for 6.46 million. That is 5.6 million is our general budget. Through our general budget, we fund not only the work here, but also we support all of the work throughout, these, uh, throughout the churches in the United States. But there's $800,000 of that that is a capital uh, need that we have that you can see over there is the chapel project. We want to eradicate Central's bank debt within a three-year period. 800000 a year will basically mean that in three years we will have eradicated Central's bank debt. Central is not a church that believes in long-term debt, but we are okay with short-term debt paying it off quickly because we believe that that is the right strategy to use. 
And so through that commitment of your giving and then helping us get to that point of achieving that vision goal, we can achieve that within a three-year period. That chapel, you're going to hear more about this, is essential for us because we believe that everyone needs to find their voice and actually pay a part in joining creation in, in glorifying and praising God. You'll hear more about that through the summer. Secondly, up here, you can see midweek. I am concerned that November 24 is coming, folks. If you don't know what is happening in November 24, you will in a couple of weeks. Yet again, the nation will be polarized over many important issues, and sadly, the church is polarized too. We have a heart here for equipping us to be able to engage in the conversations in a Christ-like, in a scriptural way that actually helps the lost and the believer to understand the appropriate Christian response uh, and not contribute to any of the polarization. And so we're going to have a 10-week cycle in the fall where we will basically uh, work through some of these equipping topics. The first one we're likely to do is the whole theme of inclusion exclusion we're probably going to look at immigration there are other issues that we want to tackle just to in a conversational way to help us unpack and be equipped to play a valid role in what will happen next year the site no good vision comes without a three-letter acronym right a tla I've got a, we've got a TLA in there, RRI neutral. This is a key thing for me. I just recognize that at some point in time, I am going to be asked to hand off this ministry to someone else. And when I do that, I want to make sure that I do not saddle the next leader to have to raise significant amounts of money just to enable things to keep going on. RRI neutral is a commitment that I have, and we, uh, I pray that we would develop to uh, basically find a way of, of repairing, replacing, and improving this site without tapping into any funds from our general budget. At this point in time, between 12.7 and 15% of our general budget is put, into one, put to one side uh, to make sure that I never have to ask you to help us repair the, uh, replace the carpet, uh, replay, repair or replace the blacktop in the parking lot, or even some of the tech issues that we have around here. Our goal is to cover those. But as Holland becomes increasingly post-Christian, as the churches continue to shrink and merge, as the market continues to be heavily saturated, we have to face the facts that unless we knuckle down and work really hard, we will be saddling our children and our grandchildren with the responsibility of what we have built. I cannot do that. We have to look at the assets that God has put in our hands and we have to say, how do we become RRI neutral so that nearly 100% of the money that you invest into this place doesn't go to overhead, as in facility overhead. It actually goes into ministry overhead, recognizing that our ministry overheads are supporting a world, worldwide move of God. And I said this to Pastor Lynn from the beginning, Lynn, I want us to get to the point where even our overheads are missional. Our overheads here are funding the work of God around this nation. But I want to get to the point where our facility is RRI neutral. And so it's my commitment to get us to the point where by July of 2025, taking two years, we are going to explore what we do with what is, what we do with the assets that we have to get to a point where we can develop plans to get to an RRI neutral position so that when it comes time for me to hand off this ministry, I can hand this off knowing that I'm not asking the next leader to raise significant funds just to keep things where they are. I want our investment to go into ministry, not into infrastructure. And so that's a key commitment that we have. And lastly here, multi-church. You'll see this in a couple of weeks with this homecoming. God has worked. I would never have thought when I stood on this stage and asked you to invest $450,000 in sending Torrin and Jordan uh, to start TLC that this one move would now mean that we are a family of churches in the U.S. of over 10, 11,000 people every week. It's, it, it, it's amazing. But all of that is run from right here with our staff up there. And, and this has got big. And I'm not called to lead a multi-site. I'm called to lead a local church. And I want to get back to leading a local church. And so what we're doing is we're creating a committee of business leaders 
to help us look at where does this thing go? And our prayer is over the next 12 months, we will, we will discern where this thing is to go because God has blessed this thing. And what I know is the support structures you put in place are only, ever, are only good and sustainable if God doesn't bless it. The minute God blesses it, the minute you're on your knees asking God what you do with it. And that's where we're at. And so you can look at all of this, and, and understandably, you can have mixed emotions. But I want to say this again as the team sing this song. Let's deal with our mixed emotions with this, personally, in our own relationships. Let's deal with mixed emotions, because when we deal with those mixed emotions, we don't compromise our behavior. And the history of this church shows us that when we deal with those mixed emotions, God is faithful. Sometimes there's a famine Because I fail to store away And sometimes it's because You just choose to hold the rain But one thing I am sure of the part that doesn't change You are faithful all the same And sometimes there's a trial Because I've wandered far away And sometimes it's because You just want to build my faith And this is my assurance That whatever comes my way are faithful all the same.
Thank you, Craig, for sharing today. I'm looking forward, I'm sure as many of you, looking forward to what weeks, uh, what the weeks to come hold for us. But um, my prayer is that you'll be blessed, that you'll walk with the Lord as you leave this place. Don't forget that if you're a member, there is voting happening in the lobby for delegates and elders. And we will see you next week with Pastor Corey.